So it's on, but it's okay. Here we go. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Mm. All that worship is so beautiful. <laughs> I don't even want to leave. Like, yeah, I don't even want to move on. I just want to stay in that moment. You know what I mean? Mm. Mm, there's something about worship. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Bless you, God. We're all familiar with the story of Cain and Abel and how they both brought gifts to the Lord. But God favored one gift over the other. And as a result, Cain killed his brother. But God wants his, our best. He wants us to bring not our leftovers. He wants our best. He wants our all. I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you. I surrender all to you. I give to you withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding Holding nothing, Jesus. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. I surrender all to you. I 
said, we're not done. <laughs> um, today is Pastor Appreciation Day. I, I've known Pastor Ron. Sherry and I started coming here in May of 19. And uh, I believe he was the first person to greet us. And we actually came in, uh, even though he was the one who greeted us. But uh, he's, been a, he's been a good pastor, obviously. Uh, but he's also, he's also a good friend. And if you, if you get to know the man, um, you learn to love him because he loves you. And he doesn't use the word love like a lot of people do. When he, Pastor Ron says he loves you, you can take that one to the bank. So we really appreciate him. Uh, Pastor Thomas, I met him when uh, he first started coming to church a couple years ago. Um, he's an army guy, so he's disciplined. And above all, uh, he loves the Lord. And for both both of these men, you can you can tell. You can look at them. You know they love the Lord. You know they want to help people. You know they want to move the Lord's kingdom forward as he direct, as the Lord directs. And so we do this once a year, but really we should do it every day. You need to appreciate them. You need to certainly pray for them. Um one of us every day. So with that said, uh, this, is, this is more appreciation bling. Um, but these are presents, so you don't open presents till you go home. So I'd also like everybody, if you would, to stand and, and um, put your hand out. We're going to pray for them both. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for these men. We thank you for these leaders. We thank you for these guidance counselors, as it were. We thank you for these men that you've placed before us to lead and guide us, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for both of them. We thank you, Lord, that they work together to move your kingdom forward. We thank you, Lord, for all that they do for each and every one of us. We thank you for their prayers. We thank you for the words that they speak. And, Lord, we thank you for the men that they are. We thank you for their big hearts. And even though Pastor Ron is taller than everybody, we, we just thank you for that. Lord, we ask you to be with them in a special way. We honor them today, but, Lord, indeed, we honor them every day. We thank you. We thank each of them for their service to you, for their service to all of us. We ask you, Lord, to just bless them, bless their families. Lord, keep your hand upon them as we move forward in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm. Good morning, church. First, just let us just, just thank God, Father. We just thank you. We just honor you and worship you, Father. We're thankful for everyone who taking the time to give appreciation on one aspect or another. Um, but I just want to just divert that really quick. We, I, I, we're appreciative of that, you know what I mean? But all of us, because some of these jobs that we're called to do in the kingdom don't come with much appreciation. But it comes with great gratification. Because of what we do, we don't do for those around, those beneath, those aside. We do for the one who is above. So I am appreciative of the appreciation, but God says, divert that back. Because the, the worship was so powerful. 
And it wasn't because of the pastor. It was because the high priest was here today. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit, because the Ruach was able to move. Amen. And we have to get to a place where that always is the number one focus. Give credit where credit is due, but never forget to give reverence where reverence is due. Amen. And so, God, we just thank you. We honor you, Father, for being such a good God, an on-time God, moving, Father, in the midst, giving us grace when it's not warranted, giving us love when we have turned our back on your love so many times, Father. You say surrender. Song says, I surrender. He says, my people need to surrender. Father, we thank you, Father, for the glorious might, your glorious love, your glorious nature, Father. We pray, Father, you will continue to have mercy on a wretched man such as me, a wretched man such as we, Father. That we will never let our status or title, who we think we are, what we think we're not, ever keep us distracted from who you say you are. And you are the great I am. Father, we bring everything to you. I, Father, you was, I pray you would speak through me today, but to me today, Father. To all of us, Father Lord Jesus, that all of us will get knocked off that high horse like Saul so that we can get to the place you're calling us to be like Paul. Father, we just worship you, praise you, and give your name the honor and the glory. In Jesus' most matchless name we do say and pray. Amen. Amen. Church, we just hope and pray that you have your Bibles today. Thank God for another day. I was just really moved. I'm moved in a lot of ways, but just moved today with the worship. I do appreciate the appreciation. Let's take time and make time to give and acknowledge our brothers and sisters in the faith. Amen. Which is all of us. Amen. All of us, if we're in the kingdom, thank God that that's a blessing in and of itself. But then whatever job we have, whatever position we play, thank God for you. Everybody is needed. The ecclesia, amen. I know we give a lot of credit to the quarterback. Well, we're not talking about the Steelers, but, but we give a lot of credit to the quarterback. But if there's no cornerback, no linebacker, no wide receiver, there is no winning team, amen. So I am thankful for everyone who has contributed and imposited in my life to help keep me going because we all need to keep going. We all have things God says you Got to surrender, amen? But that ain't even what the message is that he impressed upon my heart. I was asking the Lord, you know, always. I start looking at the ceiling. Because I'm asking, we all need to be asking, Lord, what is it you want us to hear today? And even though mom was talking about Cain and Abel, I don't know where she got that from. Well, because the message might have to do with that. But what God was saying in a different way is, well, you know, a lot of these times when we hear these messages in the Bible, we, have, we just get so inundated. We've heard it so many times. We just automatically take our mind right to, you know what Cain did. First of all, God says pause because he says he wants us to remember, you know what you all do. And there's always this tendency, all of us, where we like to disassociate ourselves with characters in the Bible. When God says all the characters in the Bible or at any one time you have been you or will be you. Amen. I should tell the youth because that's what God tell me one day. Like the youth, you have to pay attention. Why? Wow, this don't make sense. Because you got front row seats to people's failures. If the adults would put their pride to the side, if we'll get in church and actually be real and say, no, I, I got issues. I had to come up here to pray because I'm just I'm another person just like you. We, we got to get out of the church where the pastor got it all together, where the people got it all together, what, then what do we need God for? What do we need God for? Let's be real. Let's be transparent. Amen. But he says, I brought what was in my heart. That's what he told me. What does that got to do with the birds and the bees? I brought what was in my heart. So why should my brother bleed? I brought what was in my heart. This is what he had me focus on and he told me early on, sometimes I don't know, that this is going to have to be split down in two so we can kind of focus on the first aspect. But it's one statement, two parts. I brought what was in my heart. We all do. And then it's, why should my brother bleed? Now, we know Cain killed Abel. But when we just read it that way, I think we just miss a lot of the nuances, amen, a lot of the things that God wants us to see. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you have your Bibles, 
Somebody pray for this young man in the back. <laughs> Remember Genesis. Genesis. <laughs> Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 and 8. It's going to be the main set of scriptures, I guess, in one way, shape, or another we're going to be looking at today. But Genesis, the fourth chapter, chapter 1 through 8. Yep, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. Pastor Ron, making sure, making sure PR is paying attention. Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 8. But before we get there, we got to know that before there was a Genesis 4, there was a Genesis 3. But before we even get there, God was just reminded me today because, again, we see, we will see, we see, we will see. Cain killed Abel. And we're going to talk more about that. He was laying that on my heart 4 o'clock this morning to shift that. But before we focus on what he did, focus on what he didn't do. Focus on what we don't do oftentimes, amen? But he says, I brought what was in my heart. And this is really important because he says the thing about this surrender, even about the song surrender. A lot of times it isn't a lack of giving from the heart. It's a lack of paying attention to what it, we're actually giving from the heart. Amen. He's saying like the difference between, I like saying it, the difference between motion and progress. Sometimes we can be in motion, but we're not making progress. Sometimes we can get caught up in the activities of life and we miss out on the nuances. We miss out on the details. Amen. And so he was asking me, have you ever did something in church? Because this is a newsflash. After in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve went and go, they go entertain just like we do. What the serpent has said, Adam and Eve get told by God, just like those of us who are from God, those who are followers of the way. We hear from God. And not too long after we hear from God, guess what we're about to hear from next? The enemy. To cause us to question, to cause us to doubt. Did God really say? And they entertain like we do. All these churches get on the TV and the, and the pastor is talking about the Bible like he's talking to everybody outside the church. The number one concern of the Bible is those in the ecclesia because we want the truth. So far be it from us to go to churches who have pastors and leaders who don't want to give the truth. We want to give you a convenient lie. We want to sugarcoat things. No, we want to grow. Those of us who are in the truth want to grow in that truth, in the knowledge of that truth. Amen. But he says in Genesis 3, this is what Adam and Eve did, and they entertained the serpent. And for entertaining the serpent, he said, I can no longer allow you to stay in the Garden of Eden. You are removed. You are pushed out. You are expelled. Amen? Then we get to Genesis 4. Because Genesis 3 makes as much sense as Genesis 4. Jesus had already told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of the tree, what, you would surely die. Two parts. One death, two parts. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. The spiritual death was them being separated in a sense that God never intended them or us to be separated from God. And they're removed. But then the second part of that is exactly what, what? The consequences of sin. So Cain and Abel was the first murder in the physical. But God, again, is always saying whenever you see a manifestation of something in the physical, you always got to go back right to the beginning. In the be to the spiritual. So what's going on with Cain and Abel, primarily Cain, but Abel actually still has a part to play. That leads to all of this. But before we go any farther, just remember, because that's the part he said, focus on today. I, we, you, me, brought what was in my heart. Brought what was in my heart. And we got to separate automatically what the world keeps saying. God knows my heart. But God knowing you in my heart isn't a justification for me to continue to live wayward. It's actually a notification that I have to get right. Because he does know my heart, he's going to judge that. That doesn't mean I just stay blind and ignorant. But it's a lot of time, well intentions get caught up. But I brought what was in my heart. And it's deep because Brother Joe, see Brother Joe, you was talking to me this morning. He said, Thomas, how was Houston? Woo, you don't want to know. For y'all who don't know, my brother moved to Houston, Texas. We drove a truck 20 plus hours straight down there. And everything was fine until we got to Houston. 
Cars flying, 18 wheeler, gas all over the highway. Somebody flew past us. Somebody tried to run the truck off the road. We go into his parking garage and I literally counted. I'm not making this up. I literally counted. I was like, Ray, there's a lot of cars that got damaged. What is going on down here? We went to his parking garage. We counted. Well, I counted probably about 78 cars. One in three. Front, front damage, back damage. It's like they get hit so often, they're just like, why get it fixed? It's already just, it's, you know what I mean? It's like when Brother Brandon is driving. No, never mind. But you know what I mean? I mean, but no, I've never seen so many cars with so much damage and so much craziness. I mean, I could be here all day with all that, but I'm telling you, it's crazy. But the whole thing I even bring that up is because he never asked me to go on his trip. He said his wife was like my wife, like family members when we love somebody and they're going into a dangerous situation. The first thing we say is, we, no, 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 I don't want you to do that. And then we start thinking, when God, we know God is asking us to do something, but we know we got more reasons why we don't want to do it than why we should go with what we're being told to do. I was like, oh, well, you know, I can't. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do that. You know, but what God even showed me on that trip is how much it meant to him. Never mind the fact of what it meant to me. Never mind what some of the things God is asking a lot of us to do in here. A lot of times when he says, I give it all, it isn't you give so that you can be blessed. It's that you give and I give so that others may experience the blessing. And so what was a little inconvenience to me, I can see in many ways, including his faith. It was a big boulder in the right direction. But when we say, I gave, I give, what was I give what is, I give from my heart. I, I didn't really look at it that way like, yeah, I don't really want to do it, but I felt like I should do it. But that little bit of effort went a long way. Amen? And God wants us all to see that today. Because when we look in Genesis chapter 4, and we'll read through, we're going to notice something that maybe some of y'all noticed, but I thought was very interesting. It says, Genesis verse 1 through 8. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. They were married. And she conceived. And they had a baby. And bare Cain. Cain was the first one. God has given me a man. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Which pretty much is what Cain's name means. Verse 2. And she again bore his brother, Abel. She had another baby. And she called him Abel which loosely translated in the Hebrew means breath. Amen. Name represented just as quick as he left the earth. Amen. Vanishing. Amen. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Mm. But King was a tiller of the ground. And in a process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Abel dealt with the sheep. Cain did with the tomatoes and, you know, maybe some carrots and maybe some fruits. They had two different jobs, amen. They were two different men, amen, but they came from the same parents, amen. But Cain brings an offering, amen, to the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect means to gaze, means to inspect, means to appreciate. The Lord had respect unto Abel's offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. He didn't like it. He didn't approve of it. And Cain was very wroth, very angry, indignant, and his countenance, countenance means his face, his demeanor, Amen. And his countenance fell. So Cain takes his offering. He gets rejected. But he takes his offering first. Abel takes his offering. It gets accepted. Amen. So Cain gets upset in verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? Again, why are you angry? And why... Is thy countenance fallen? Why is your face, why is your demeanor different? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? If you do well, 
Should you not be accepted? This is God's statement to Cain or the Lord. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. There's a choice. And unto thee shall be his desire. So going on back. If thou doest well, there's a question, there's a proposition. A lot of times when we are in a situation, we like to rob ourselves of the choices God actually equipped us with. There's a choice and a lot of things we can't control, but God always tells his believers, the ecclesia, we ought to focus on the things that we can control. And he says there's something here apparently that you could have control because if he said if you do it well, shall it not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, then if you don't do it well, sin lieth at the door. Remember when it was... Some names messed up. Sapphira and Ananias, is that who it was who brought their, who sold their property? They didn't have to sell it. Then they came and lied. One drops, and they said, wait, the next one comes after him and says, before you say anything, somebody just died because the offering that they gave from their heart was rotten to the core. So the earth opened up. So the earth opened up to swallow them up. And before you say anything, tell the truth. You didn't even have to give what you're lying about. Church, he was saying, you know, this is almost like the individuals who go to church, because I think we all can be guilty if we all be honest, who go to church out of obligation. And somewhere out of their obligation, their heart become obstinate. We get so caught up in the routine. That's what they were doing. Everybody around them was given legitimately from their heart. And they feel like, well, we, we got to be part of the end group. So we got to just give out of obligation. But God says obedience is better than sacrifice. I'd rather you keep your stuff. I'd rather you keep your stingy and go on your way than to come into the house of God pretending pretending that your heart is right with me and giving things begrudgingly, giving things from a place that does not even honor me, but giving the appearance that it does. Amen? And so way before Cain killed anybody, God said to us, pay attention. He brought what was in his heart. Amen? He bought what was in his heart. Verse 7, if thou doest well, Shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, a choice, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. The desire, i.e., is what sin wants to do. Sift us out, amen? And thou shall rule over him. What would rule over him? The desire of the sin. God has given him a choice, amen? And Cain talked with Abel. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And I think that bottom part, more than likely, what we're going to go how the spirit leads. We'll probably do it next time. But the first point that came out of all of this, what may have been wrong with Cain's offering? When I was praying and Doing some things because, you know, we have speculation. I think this is why Cain's offering was rejected and Abel's offering was accepted. Amen. But keep in mind the point, the theme God was just telling us to remember is that I brought, we brought, you brought. I brought what was in my heart. Amen. But we know that there are different variables that went into effect what Cain did and versus what Abel did, amen? And so we firstly want to say, want to put this out there, the, the scriptures does not concretely say, clear as day, what Cain did or what Cain didn't do. What the scriptures provide, to my understanding, is pieces of information. You know when we used to watch Inspector Gadget, do 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 some of us used to watch Dick Tracy. I know I'm a little younger than some, but y'all know some of these detective shows where sometimes they don't get an obvious answer, but they get subtle truths. And these subtle truths make a case. And God is saying it's really not that important. That's what he told me. Because if we, if we found out that Cain wasn't accepted because of point A, what happens is when we find out that point A is why he did it, 
We don't look at points C, D, E, and F. See what I'm saying? We focus only on point A. When you don't know exactly why something happens, it keeps your mind open to the possibility of more options. Amen? Versus when you know if you only touch button A, you'll get whooped. All right, well, as long as we don't touch button, you know the kids. As long as we don't touch button A, we won't get whooped. But when you, God says something like reverence, he doesn't have to say a lot of specifics. Reverence encompasses a lot. It keeps our mind attentive, our hearts open, amen? But he says, what may have been wrong with Cain's offering? Firstly, the Bible does not conclusively say from what I can find. It doesn't say this is exactly what he did. We get glimpses of truth, amen? And this is how we have to take the Bible. That's why it says the Bible has to be precept upon precept. A lot of the pastors on TV give you one scripture, they don't even go into it. They make up some whole grandiose thing. But it's pieces. These precepts upon precepts is these pieces of information on other pieces of information give us the whole picture. Amen. So we want to understand that first. Secondly, again, the Bible doesn't have to tell us every little thing. We only have to understand it thematically. Because the Spirit, he said, the Holy Spirit will be what? Our teacher. He's going to come fill in the gap. A lot of things didn't ex ex exist in Jesus' day don't need to. The Holy Spirit is still relevant today. He's still leading and guiding. Amen? Amen? We see here that one of the things was, because this is what I thought too, to the extent, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was a tender of the sheep. And so we know when we talk about the sheep, we talk about the lamb. And when we talk about the lamb, the lamb is so symbolic in Scripture. We know that Christ is that lamb. Christ is that final offering when he comes and he returns, amen. We know that in the Old Testament, when you talk about the Mosaic law, that people had to sacrifice the lamb or the blood of animals to cleanse our sins. So the lamb makes a lot more sense because we know, although in that moment it wasn't relevant to Cain and Abel, symbolically we know it would be. We know that Christ was like a lamb in front of the shears. He was silent. Christ, the scripture says we. Ignorant in many ways, like lamb. Amen? So there's so many symbolic meanings without even going into a lot of scriptures. And so a lot of people say it. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Abel gave from the sheep. He gave from the lamb. And that's so symbolic. And Cain gave from the ground. He gave from his fruits. But that's not the case. Because when I was reading, even in the Old Testament, even in the time of the Mosaic law, although the sheep... Although the lamb, although the blood sacrifice had its place, there was still first fruits. There were still fruit sacrifices. There were still grain offerings. So it was still relevant. So God is saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Don't just think it's just because he was the sheep or he had the sheep and he had the grain. No, because God still used both of them in the latter times. Amen? So it isn't that. I was like, well, okay. The other thing is, God would have been punishing Cain for his profession. If, because whatever your profession is, that's how you provide it. You know, before we had a monetary system, you gave out of what you had. If Cain only worked on the fruits and veggies, that's all he would have to give. If Abel worked with the sheep, that's all he would have to give. So for Cain to be punished purely because of his occupation, that isn't the case either. God says, this man raised, and you know, scriptures, a lot of people, including David, were sheep herders in your job. Just like today, church, we got to hear it because we won't hear it. We got to hear it because we won't hear it. What you do is not important to who you serve. What you do on your job will never be important compared to how you act in reverence to your main job. My main job is to be a, a, a representative of Christ. Well, you say, you know, when I, I, I didn't get this job, I didn't get this, that. You don't have to to get God. God says, whatever we do, whatever we put our hands to, do it for honor and glory of God. Amen. So Cain isn't being punished for his profession and neither are you. God says, I don't care what you do. I care how you do it and who you reverence while you do it. Because people are watching you and me. Amen. Amen. So he's not punished because of his occupation and he's not accepted being able because of just a sheep. So we go a little farther and we go into point two and I said, well, what was certainly wrong with Cain's offering? Because the Bible didn't say clearly what was wrong. So we got to go with looking at the pieces and we looked at what couldn't inherently. Now there's some truth to all of that. There's some truth to the animal. There's some truth to the fruit, but that isn't why. So that was the maybe. So let's move into the area of certainty. Amen. 
Cain's offering was rejected. This was the first thing he revealed to me. First of all, because of his heart, not because of his job, not because of what he gave, his heart, his heart, amen? And it just isn't his heart, church, it's what? Our heart. I brought what was in my heart. So God said it isn't what he had, it isn't what he didn't give. It's what he wouldn't provide. We see here, we look at, whew, verse 7. If thou doest well, if thou doest well, there's a choice there. This is really important too. This is really important too because y'all remember when we had Bible study, we was talking about what about the individuals who never heard Christ? What about the people who never heard the gospel? This is one of the things that the, again, Sometimes we as genuine Christians, we have genuine questions, and you know I'm the first to say, I don't know everything. Don't ever get foolish enough to think that you do, to think that I do. We got to go to what? If you said if we knock, we'll find. If we're making time to spend time to ask God these questions, but woe be the man who says he has a question but never pursues it. He don't have a question. What you see is a lot of people have accusations against the church. Well, what about, what about the people who never heard? Well, here is the scriptures answering that for you right there. They were before Moses. They were before the law. Cain and Abel did not know anything, yet God says in scripture, if thou doest well, you cannot do well if you don't know what well is. Here God is clearly showing there are standards. We said in the Bible study before, I had did the study for another thing, and they said, you know, this group of people went and studied these different tribes around the world, these indigenous people. And they wanted to know if they had morals because they were saying Christianity is white man religion, black man religion. Christianity is being used to help control people. Okay, well, what about people who've never been exposed to that control? Do they have a moral system? Come to find out every indigenous group that they can find in parts of Africa and parts of the Amazon. These people who are secluded from the world, they haven't been tainted by Christianity yet have a moral system. And we already know if they have a moral system, then that means there is a moral law giver. You see what I'm saying? And so even though you say tomato, I say tomato, God says in the scriptures that the heavens declare his glory. He says in his scriptures that people will be without excuse. When you little, you're like, you know what, my dad can do anything. But then you get older one day, you're like, you know what, he can't hang the sun. He can't hang the moon. It's obvious. I can say she, him, them. I can be whatever I want to be. And I can tell you whatever my gender is. And I can tell all that stuff and nonsense if you want. And we are not to judge as in to convict. But we are to have uh, eyes that can judge. When you're driving down the road, people, you don't judge me. Well, why don't you say that when you drive down the street? You see a truck in front of you. You're going 45 miles an hour. Something tells you I got to be able to judge the object in front of me. It's real close. Stop. God is saying, the heavens declare my glory. I'm telling everybody around the world, stop. And they got all these reasons. They got all these excuses. They got all these things they're making up to justify why they keep going. And if they keep going, that's their fault. That's right. We have a part to play because we're, we are not to enable anybody speeding into the back of the truck. We want to make sure that our hands are clean. We simply, hey, bro, there's a truck right there in front of you. I understand you may feel this. I understand society. I understand you may. But if you don't slow down. If I don't slow down, and God is saying it's so deep because he's talking to the church because Cain was in fellowship with God. We can have a lot of things. Abel, they were in fellowship with God, which is why they had to bring the thing in the first place. So there was an acknowledgement of God. And like I said, a lot of people say, I don't believe in God because of this. Well, it turns out a lot of us, we are upset with God. We're angry with God. But that does not remove the existence of God. And he said, you brought what was in your heart. But you acknowledged me, amen? So we got to tell these people, well, I don't think I have to follow God. No, you do. You, you, you do. Unfortunately, I have days I don't want to follow him. Doesn't change who he is, amen? But he said, <laughs> that's just the truth. But we do see, like I said, this, this is another point he brought up, because you know what? And I was like, oh, I don't even know I should bring that up, Lord. We're a small church already. We shouldn't be telling people not to bring money. Because all the big churches is telling you and telling everybody by the droves. But when we say, when he says, when he shows us that you brought what was in your heart, he's actually telling people, don't even bring your money in here. None of these big churches will tell you that. None of these big churches will tell you that. If you don't bring your heart, your money is funny. 
A lot of people think themselves to be saved because they did just what Cain did. They put half the effort into all of their wallet. And so their wallet is lower, but their heart has never been elevated to the Father. He says, many people give to me, yet they know not me. And these knuckleheads want to get on the TV, and they would rather entertain you. They would rather lie to you and say, give me, give me, give me, out of their gluttony. He says that they're the hireling. They don't want to teach nobody nothing. They want to teach people how to fail. And Cain is where he is, not because of his job, because we say, the way I grew up. That's a lie, church. All of us have grown up in hard times. But the scriptures show us that that one born in Nazareth grew up in hard times too. And that we, at some point in our life, when he says there's a time he winked on ignorance, maybe there's things we didn't know, but there comes a time where we do know. And maybe you didn't go to church every Sunday, but God says when I judge people, I'm going to judge them to the extent that they knew. Amen? But if you bring something to me, make sure your heart is right. Otherwise, you're just checking the block. Otherwise, you're just coming to church. You're getting in the rotation, yet you've rotated out of relationship. And he's saying that to all of us. Amen, church? Me too. Brother, you don't got it together? I sure don't. That's why we need him. Amen? He said, if thou doest well, it shall be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Again, a revelation of God means that we must acknowledge a relationship exists, even for the atheists, even for the agnostic. Now, what they do with their relationship is between them and God, what we do. Amen? But that word lieth, we look up that word lieth, it said in Hebrew it was translated, it does mean crouching, but in Hebrew it's talking about a demon that is waiting behind the door. So he said, I give you a choice. You came to give me something, and sometimes that's what we get caught up in. My heart. No, God knows when I gave that. No, God knows when you gave that. You're right. You just, we answer our own questions sometimes. Because we can, we can lullify and, and fool everybody else around us. And that's why you get these brothers and sisters coming here some looking good, smelling good, sounding good. Anything else that rhymes with good. And to us, perception a lot of times is reality. But perception is not God's reality. He doesn't look at what he perceives. He looks at what he knows. And he said he judges the heart. He said he judges the reins. What's going on deep inside? And this individual, Cain, comes to me. He gives me something, but it's not from his heart. He just fired us off from the hip. He's that millionaire that goes into church and says, I gave a million dollars. But again, remember, we talk about the widow's might. She gave from what she had, all of what she had. And it wasn't what she had that he acknowledged. He acknowledged the heart in which she gave from what she gave. And these other guys come in here and throw a couple hundred here like they're doing the Lord a favor. Like you're going to do a tip drill for the Lord. Come on. You're not doing no favors for God. God says, matter of fact, when you pray, you better understand why sometimes he isn't doing favors for us. Because we're trying to tip God. We're trying to give God. We're not giving God from our heart. And again, it don't even have nothing to do with money. But yet you turn on the TV, that's the first thing we hear. Money, money, money. No. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Is that some of these churches love money first? And if you're lucky, they'll love me and you second. If we're lucky. Amen? So he said that's a demon behind the door. But crouching also means obviously like an animal. It does mean that as well in the literal sense. Sitting there. See, sometimes we say the devil's like a roaring lion. And that's true. But sometimes the devil doesn't have to go hunt us down. He was given... Cain, an option. He said, if you don't want to do what's right, you're going to go forward. We know he went forward. Why? Because somebody died. So when the Bible tells us to take every thought captive, and I, you know, we all was, oh, okay. But it started with a thought. At some point, Cain and Abel knew that God desired an offering from them. And Cain had to think like we often think, well, I I want to give to the Lord, but I got this other thing. I got my friends. I got this hobby. I got this addiction. So I'm going to please God by giving him half. I'm going to give God the crumbs off the table, and he's supposed to be satisfied with that. So when I come give him my offering, how dare he correct me? How dare he be mad at me that I'm upset? 
Never mind the fact of the thoughts that went through my head, the thoughts that I did not hold captive, the warnings he gave me before I ever came to him. How dare he correct me and get mad at me? How dare he say your face? Of course my face is. I'm upset. But he says I brought what was in my heart. It don't just stop there. Why? Why should my brother bleed? He said, Cain, if you don't stop and correct your action, what does it say? Sin, after it has produced, after it has matured, it leads to what? Death. And sometimes when we say death, we, we all, because you know people, let's be honest, church, you know, it's about us, it's about me, this is the me, me, me age, selfie. When we say death, sometimes it's like, okay, I don't care what happens to me, but because we're not aware of our brethren, we don't even understand. It's not you that dies sometimes, it's other people. It's other people. And he said, Thomas, talk about that next week. But I came to Cain because Cain came to me. He came to give an offering, but his offering was off key. I told him, if you don't get your heart right, don't give me anything. Get your heart right. Because once your heart is right, once our heart is right, church, then that affects what we give, how we give, why we give, to whom we give. It affects everything. But these churches want to tell you to give first. And people are lost. Because they never got truth. God says, no, your heart needs to be right first so you can receive truth. Then that will dramatically enhance how you give, what you give, why you give, why we do what we do. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Cain, that devil, that demon is crouching at the door. Church, he's talking to all of us if we're honest today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, because we were talking about some things that may have caused Cain's offering to be rejected. And then he says there's some things that certainly led. The first one was the heart. Amen. His heart wasn't right. And again, he says, church, don't just read this thing like Cain. Like, Cain, you shouldn't have did that. He said, read this thing like it's you. Think of an area in your life. When the lights go out, when the music stops, when the smiling is at a, at, a, at a standstill, and you gotta come face to face with your real realities, with your real insecurities, with our real shortcomings. Because if we're not real, we are not gonna get real healing, amen? And so we, we gotta understand that, but we got a Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, and it says, Wait, this is another reason King's offering was rejected by faith. By faith, not his job, not an animal, not fruit, not because he was first, Cain was first, and Cain was the firstborn, not because he was the oldest, not because you're the young. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Faith had something to do. Faith always has something to do. And as funny as that is, we was kind of talking about that at Bible study too. Faith offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Abel gives what he gives by knowledge because Cain gave by knowledge. They knew God had an expectancy and they had to deliver on that. But when Cain delivered it, he delivered from his heart. I mean, Abel delivered from his heart. Cain delivered from another place. And when he delivered from that other place that knew not God, God knowing him, loving us, said, you got to correct that. If you keep going forward, that's the thing about the train that won't stop. If you don't stop the train early enough, the person inside at some point really wants it to stop. They really don't want to hurt nobody. We are all guilty of that if we're honest. We can honestly see that God has showed us things in our life that God says, and first of all, God is not the author of the past. The past only serves as a reference. It's not to keep us there. It's not to keep us tormented. It's not to keep us tortured. Right. But you got to understand that when the conductor decides he wants to get this train up and running, once it gets to a certain speed, there ain't no stopping. And that's what he's telling Cain. Cain, if you, do, if you don't stop and you go forward, it's going to bring up about a thing in you you don't even want to do. And we don't see that a lot of times. We, we, we are... Lack of depth a lot of times. We only see what we want to see. And God, he's looking at the whole playing board. I mean, he's looking at the whole chess board. Amen? But he says to him, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Faith came into play for Abel's offering, not just the fact that it was a sheep. 
And God says to him, he's righteous. So there's something you did that was right in Abel, but there was something clearly that you did that was wrong in Cain. It says God testifying of his gifts. God testifying of Abel's gifts. And by it, he being dead yet speaking, which is another point that was interesting. But we know that the scripture says that without faith, it's impossible, not improbable. It's not that it's not likely. It's impossible. It cannot. It will not be done. And so here we have Cain who is upset. Clearly. His offering does not please God. Another sign that it was lacking what? Faith in Cain's part department. So his heart was had a condition, but also his faith. You gave from a place that did not acknowledge me. You know of me, but it was lacking relationship with me. Abel had faith. He when he gave what he gave, he also said when you look back in the scripture, he said that Abel gave of the firstlings his best. And he gave of the fat. The first lien is the first of the first. The first lien is the equivalent of, you know, it's payday today. <laughs> hey, you know, I got to pay off the bank because I want them to get the house. I got to pay off the car because I got to be able to drive around the house. I got to pay for the food because I got, can't be in the house with no food. I got to pay for the lights because you can't be in the house with no lights. And God said, but what about me? Again, it ain't, it ain't about just money like these knuckleheads on TV. It's your first. He didn't have money to give back then. Ooh, we're going to talk about that one Sunday. Time is always money. No, it ain't. It's your time. It's your offerings. Whatever God gave to you, you can give back. Let's go to a place where they'll come and give us the truth. Instead of digging in our wallet. Instead of digging in our wallet. Dig into my heart. Love me enough to tell me when I'm wrong. To say, brother, hey, I love you enough to tell you you're falling by the truth. Oh, I ain't going to tell her nothing. That ain't love. That ain't love. That ain't love. Amen? But he says that he came from a place of faith. And that he says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And that if we have faith, he says faith also has his brother. You know, his coat of arms right behind him. It's effort. Where there is faith, there is an increase in effort. There was an increase in effort. If I have faith in this relationship, and let's just say I'm married or I have a, a relationship with my employer, never mind God. You know, sometimes you, you don't even got to go to God first, but God always brings it back to him. Everything has to do with centered around him. But if I have faith in this relationship I'm in, what do you naturally give? Effort. But let me ask y'all a question. If you don't think this relationship is going to work out, how many of us are like, you know what? I'm going to let it. I'm going to blow my back oil out, my back bearings. You ain't doing all of that. This job, well, he wants to get rid of me, huh? Y'all seen wrong with that welding machine? Oh, I'll show him. Don't do that, Ron. Don't do that. I'll weld his mouth shut. Don't do that, Ron. Don't do that. Don't do that. But let's be honest. We get upset. We get emotional. We all do. But if I know my employer's about to fire me, now I'm, I got a job right now where it's seasonal. At some point, you might as well just go ahead and leave because, you know, you probably ain't going to be here anyway because that's what God's telling you to do. These are the thoughts that was bouncing around in Cain's. Long before he came to give, God said, wait a minute, go back. Remember, he says, if you come to the altar and you haven't even forgiven your brother or your sister, <laughs> don't come up here and pray. Go on back. Ask for forgiveness. Go on back and make reconciliation. Go on back and correct what I've shown you. So we get mad at God, but God showed Cain what you're giving I don't even want, because what you're not giving, you have to address that first. Go fix that, amen? But you also don't have this faith. The faith, there's something that you're not acknowledging in that. And again, it's faith. We, you know, in the world today, we want God to show up first, and then we will supply the effort. And that's why he said faith and effort is closely related. God says have faith first. And if you have faith, because it's easy to say that, if I say I believe God will do this, but well, then I'll naturally start walking in a way that shows my effort is in alignment with my faith. And I can be guilty and say I haven't always done that. But what we are guilty of, we all say, oh, I trust God to do. And we don't move a muscle. We ain't moving nothing. We ain't even prayed for what we said we believe. God says the faith or your lack of faith is shown by your lack of effort. Amen. 
Before we even bust the works down, he said, just look, because you, all of us are guilty, amen? All of us are guilty. So by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, though which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting. How does he commend him? By accepting a lot of the times, we want to know if God approves of a situation, of a circumstance in our life. Well, he says, did God accept it? This is a lot of times we know there's things that God doesn't accept, but we don't want to let it go. We don't want to give it up. But we're like, I, I, I'm trying to figure out the Lord's will for my life. Let's be honest, church, sometimes we're not. We're trying to figure out how we can get the Lord to accept what we want to wiggle in. What we want to wiggle in. And Cain was like, well, you know what? I know God's telling me to give something, but I don't really want to give my first. When you read the fat in the, in the scripture, the fat is the best. First is the first, first, first. You give first. Whether it's your time, your energy, your effort, you give that first. And then if you don't have enough, then you, you sacrifice in other areas. But we're in a culture today with like, Lord, <laughs> after I pay this, after I pay Brother Brandon off, after I pay this, whatever's left. That's the crumb mentality. And we're like, Cain, how did you get there? Well, Cain said, well, if he was honest today, he said, because I had the crumb mentality. I was only willing to give God, after I took all the fruit that was good, all the ones that had scars and blemish, all the ones that was spot and wrinkled, I gave God that. And God said, no, 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 no. I'm more valuable than that. Your heart is wrong. You don't even see the value in that. Your faith is off. You don't even trust and believe that if you give from your first, I will provide. Your faith is off, you see, because the effort would be aligned with it. Amen. And we go to Proverbs. I'm almost done. I really appreciate your patience. Amen. Brother Greg. <laughs> Proverbs, the fourth chapter. Proverbs, the fourth chapter. Verse 23. Proverbs, the fourth chapter. Verse 23. I'm just telling you that so you can go there, but we're going to go back. This is something he told me 3 o'clock this morning when I was like, oh, Lord, I'm ready to sleep. But he sometimes asks him, but wait a minute. Are you ready to listen? Are you ready to give this sacrificial love, something that's going to inconvenience you because what I did for you inconvenienced me? If everything we do is surrounded by our convenience, God is asking the question, are you really doing it for me? Amen. Amen? A lot of the times, and I can be honest, some of the biggest blessings in my life have come at the most inconvenient times. I ain't going to lie. This trip to Houston, I said, oh, no, 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 no. The devil's a lie. I am not drunk. But I prayed, and then God said, you, you, you need to do this. But if you're going to do it, don't go down there making all this noise and all this fuss. Don't do what the hypocrites do. Right. Don't do what the hypocrites do. Well, y'all know I'm helping my brother because I'm a loyal servant. No, 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 no. Get your heart right. Because if your heart isn't right, I'd rather you not even do it, Thomas. If your heart isn't right, I'd rather you not even do it. Get your heart right. Amen? But before we get to Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 23. I don't know if some of y'all seen that movie. I used to like that movie. It's called The, the Last Samurai. The last time, Brandon, see, this is what I'm talking about. There's always that one in the back. He's pulling out a real sword. Brandon, put that away. <laughs> but, but in The Last Samurai, y'all know, y'all might have seen it, but, you know, it's The it's Last Samurai, but Tom Cruise is in it. I'm not saying you should watch it or not watch My point is, you know, he, he, he's a white guy. He gets taken into captivity by, I want to say, the Japanese. And so long story short, he ends up be, being befriended by them. He first was hired to kill them. He was a captain, and he, hired, he was part of a whole army. The whole army got overtaken by these Japanese, and they take him prisoner. And he goes into these hills, and he learns their ways, and he starts to see their lifestyle, and he starts to get empathy for them, and then he starts to develop a relationship for them. And then the guy he kills, Japanese culture at the time, he had to go in. He didn't even know it. He couldn't speak the language. He had to go in to the family of the family he bereaved. The wife of the soldier he killed is the one actually taking care of him. And so throughout this movie, like I said, good point, but 
there's this interaction, and you can see that the, one, the thing he at one time hated becomes the thing he once loved. But to me, this is the theme story for everybody who does not know Christ. But people come along your way. People come along the path. We are sometimes those people who come along the path. And sometimes we get mad at people because they don't change overnight. But the truth is we didn't. And God says, you know what, when I bring somebody to you, and I need you to give what's in your heart. I don't need you to check the Christianity block. I need you to love them. I need you to be real. There's enough face funk floating around. Be real. Be sincere. You don't change anybody. He says, Thomas, I do. I do. But be real. Be sincere. Amen. But in that movie, you know, when Tom Cruise, he's, he's wounded. He's literally the last one because they're going up against howitzers and guns. So they got sword still. So they get all shot down and Tom Cruise is the last one. And at the very end of the movie, he goes up to the emperor and the emperor is conflicted. It's like the believer, too, because part of Japan wants to stay what's old. We want to keep their traditions. We want to stick to what we know. But the emperor was conflicted because the other part of Japan wanted to be going to what was new. And God is saying the believer has the same battle. Because we want to fight to stick to what we know, what's normal, even if it's for our detriment. But the other part of us, he said it's a war. There's a war being waged. And the people don't say it on TV, but they just say, oh, Cain just killed somebody. No, he didn't. He killed himself first. He stopped believing. He stopped accepting who God says he was. He stopped trusting in the Lord. He stopped giving things. Maybe at one time he was giving it from his heart. Now he's just giving it. And God was like, wait a minute, because I love you, I'm going to say something to you. What you're doing is not right, Cain. If you don't stop it, it's going to take you down a road. A lot of times we get mad at people that are at dead ends in their life. And God says, well, remember, I put you there at one point in their life to be a warning sign. And when they came down the street, you turned your back on them. And now they're in the dead end. See, that's what God is saying. Instead of us judging everybody, instead of judging everybody, judge the part we play. Maybe God put you at a, an important intersection of somebody's life. Let's not give half effort. Let's not do Cain. Amen? That's what he's saying. But I remember Tom Cruise had his knife because he came up to the emperor. He all beat up and jacked up. And the emperor, who was in this conflict, finally decides the new thing, which was actually bad for Japan at that time. But he, was, he had so much pressure on him. But now all the samurai, and samurai means to serve. All these men actually ended up in service of the emperor. They were trying to protect this old way. And they would come talk to the emperor at times, and he had all these conflicts. And so at the very end of the movie, the emperor has finally made up his mind that he's going to do what he should have done all along. And now Tom Cruise is the last samurai that's left. And he asked him when the tradition was to give the emperor the sword, he, he said, I want you to tell me how, I think his name was Hatsumoto. But he was like the leader of them. But he gets killed. I want you to tell me how he died. And Tom Cruise says, no, I will tell you how he lived. I say all of that because when you look at Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commanded as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, listen, Though he died, though Abel died, the scripture says he still speaks. Abel is gone, but what he did lives on. So I'm not going to tell you how he died. I'm going to tell you how he lived. Church, if you turn on the TV, don't turn on the TV. Don't turn on the TV. We don't need the TV to tell us our time here is limited. And what we want to make sure we're doing or not doing is giving King offerings. We want to make sure we're paying attention to that. Amen? That we're going to have to give account for this life. Regardless of how this brother made me feel or this sister made me feel. I have to give a, an account to God. And God, because, his, he, because he loves us, he don't let us just wander. He does give us what he gave King. Something in your, in your life you need to cur 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 curve it, swerve it, correct it. Amen? Proverbs chapter 4, and I appreciate your patience. Proverbs 4, 23, keep thy heart with all diligence. Not some, not the majority. Keep your heart with all diligence. 
you're looking intently. We are, me too, looking intently, amen? For out of it are the issues of life. Why did Cain kill Abel? We'll talk more about that next week, but his heart clearly wasn't right, which led him down the wrong path. God, loving him and loving us, stepped in on his path and said, stop. Don't give me. Do, don't keep going to these churches. I want you to empty out your pocket. Maybe I need you to empty out your pride. Maybe I need you to empty out other things. So don't go to that church down the street. Go to wherever you go where you're getting fed. But I love you enough to say stop. But if you crash this line, you're going to go through a doorway. And if you go through this doorway, this doorway is going to lead you to other demons who's going to lead you to other places you don't even want to be. And long before Abel got slewed, long before Cain got to the field, long before Cain started talking to Abel, Long before all that, he went through the doorway that God was telling him, that he was telling us, do not go through. Don't give me anything, because I don't need anything. Everything I have is from me. What you going to give me that's going to sway me? You ain't. Don't give me anything. Go back and get your heart right, church. That's what I'm saying to all of us, amen? Me too, amen? So if you feel so glad, you are welcome to bow your head. And I just want to pray for me. For all of us, we all need it. We all are in times, we all are in tribulations, we all have faced circumstances where we have become king Mish. And so we are thanking God first and foremost because he is a loving God. Pain does not mean God does not love us. Pain actually means that he does. And he's trying to make a point. He's trying to get his people. He's trying to grab his children because he loves us. Amen. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the word, Father. We thank you for your presence in this place, Lord Jesus, that is not contingent upon any of us being here, that isn't contingent upon what we bring or what we don't bring, how we sing and how we don't sing. It's all contingent upon you. Father, we just thank you for moving in this place today, Father. But we pray even more so that you will continue to move in our hearts, Lord Jesus. We all need you. We all need you, Father. Father. In Jesus' name, for anyone who may be here that may not know you, Father, you say in your scripture and in your word, it is not your will that any should perish. So as the music starts, if you feel led, don't be worried about everybody else. Come to the altar to get prayer. Come to another brother or sister in the church. It doesn't have to be me or Ron. Let's come together as the ecclesia to worship and honor God. Father, we also pray you would help us to be aware of things we do out of habit, Lord Jesus, and make us make sure we turn back to make sure what we do, we do because of love, Father. Father, we just praise you. We just honor you. We give your name the praise and the honor and the most glory. You are the most glory. All, all, all.